I am thrilled today to spend time with two of Canada's musical giants. They are Juno award-winning fiddle virtuosos Natalie McMaster and Danelle Leahy. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. We are, we've been working for months on getting you here. We're so excited. What a great time of year to talk to you. And, you know, I look at the two of you. You both had your own high-flying careers individually. You've won the Order of Canada. You've won two Junos, 11 East Coast Music Awards. You've uh, founded Leahy and you've won three Junos on your own. You guys are amazing. And now you're working together. What is that like? <laughs> Doesn't this say it all? Go ahead, Natalie. <laughs> so improving Where marriage. do I start? <laughs> well, it's been interesting. As we were walking to this beautiful studio today, I was describing how, you know, for years I did this myself, for decades. I'm, I'm ancient. Anyway, I'm 46, so we got married when we were 30. I was 30. And um, so I had been playing for a good 20 years <clears throat> myself, and then getting married to Danelle, you know, we, it's inevitable, two fiddlers getting married, of course we're going to play music together, and then our children are born, and then they, you know, start showing signs of musicality, so um, what is all this like? It's really a dream. Honestly, I, when we're bogged down with life's day-to-day -day things, like getting kids to bed, or making meals, or rushing out the door, and you're like, Arr. you know, <laughs> or just, you think, I keep saying to Danelle, you know, if somebody told me when I was 19 or 20 or however old, 10, 25, that I'd look around and this would be my life, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is far exceeded anything I could have dreamed about. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And now yeah. you're actually traveling with your kids, as you said, yeah. on the Celtic Family Christmas Music Tour. Danelle, what has that been like? Traveling with the children? Yeah. <clears throat> well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't travel without them. So it allows us to, you know, bringing them with us allows us to do our thing and we were uh, we're musically inclined and and um, we've always played and and we feel we're kind of called in a way to to play for people so it's been great and, and the kids you know we never intended them to, to play with us but it was a natural they're genetically forced to play <laughs> and and they they come with us and they learn to play and you, you give them little tasks you want them to feel part of a tour or part they, they, they need to be there, so they have to carry the fiddles in and set the shoes up. And eventually, one ended up on stage, and the next one said, "Well, if she gets to go out, I should be able to go out." And <laughs> now Natalie and I are fighting for our spot on the show. <laughs> I'm like, "What's this? I only get one solo? Come, Come on. on! Who are these kids?" <laughs> but you said it best. Danelle said it best one time. Somebody said, to "You, oh my gosh, it must be so hard traveling with the kids." And Danelle said, "It's harder traveling without them." Mm. Can't imagine that. That's, so that's good. Yeah. That's the truth right there. And this tour uh, goes across Canada. You are going to Roy Thompson Hall on December 20th for an epic concert. Mm. If people want to find out more, the website is Danelle, uh, Natalie and Danelle. Yep. Is that right? Dot com. I mm. think so. <laughs> we'll that's a tough screen. question. Yeah, put it on the I screen. Thought I, could, I thought Whatever I could answer everything. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, you, now, you guys grew up with music. This yeah. is how you grew up, in, in, in a sense, kind of just absorbing it through your pores. Tell me a little bit about what it was like to grow up in your households. I'll go ahead. Well, I'm one of 11 siblings, and um, it was music, uh, church music, and sometimes school, and farming. We grew up on a farm, and... There was always music being played. We had a piano, 11 kids trying to play one piano. <laughs> and mom and dad were slick. They had it figured out. Someone would stay on the piano and another, another one, one of us would want the piano. You couldn't have it until they were finished. But mom and dad would say that loudly enough that the piano player would hear, you can't have it till Siobhan's finished. Well, Siobhan wouldn't get off. And there'd be a lineup. So there's, there were never enough instruments. Mm. If that was busy, you'd play the guitar. If someone had the guitar, it's like, what can I play? The fiddle, there's only one fiddle. Well, so there was this demand. You, had, you were challenged, you were, you were, you know, you competed to, 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 to have an instrument. How come uh, we're not doing that? Yeah, we, they, we have too many instruments. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was great. I always had a piano player, which is a big deal for a fiddle player. I always had a listener. That's a hard thing for, uh, we, we meet a lot of musicians and, and, and families and you need a reason to play, you need an inspiration, you need a listener. I always had my mom and dad or my sisters or my brothers and with 11 I, kids or something yeah or something. so that you know it was it was pretty good it was pretty good I, I I see fiddle players and musicians now and they have no one to play for mm. that's hard and it was the same with faith for both of you as well Natalie you grew up in a home where faith was kind of just absorbed in your family tell me how it was played out yeah we was never faith was never a compartment you know that you pull out at certain times mom and dad just were 
Uh, we grew up in a Catholic home, and my mother and father were very, even though they're not knowledgeable about their faith, they have the heart of the faith. Mm. And the heart of the faith is just really good at loving in a serving kind of way. Really good. They're just really good at just being, doing what is common sense, what is right, what is um, beautiful to do, and without even thinking about it. They were molded in that way. Um, they were very, and, and are, they're, I'm not talking as if they're passed away, but they're alive and, and perky. They were just on our Christmas special. Um, <laughs> but they, they, uh, they just really exemplified to me what I would want to become which is just someone who doesn't have to think about it or it's not so learned, it's more just really natural and from the heart. Mm, very organic. Yeah, yeah, so. You know, Danelle, there's this moment where you have your, your parents' faith and it's kind of your cultural faith almost in a sense, I guess, and then you have to choose it. You have to own it yourself. When did that happen for you? You know, I don't think that ever happened for me. I think, uh, I've heard that people talk about that. I mean, it was always number one above everything else. Mm. And it was in everything we did. And we weren't, the, the, my parents weren't the ones to go out and broadcast it, but it was like, it was, it was like eating. It was like water. So I never had a moment where, like I went off to university and I, I never had this moment where I had to go, hmm. It was just always ingrained in me. Yeah, me too. And so um, I'm very appreciative of that. You know, we have children yeah. now and we have all these, uh, you know, challenges of raising children like our parents did. And, and, and we talked before about, I've become my dad. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it happens. It happens, but now I see it. I see it. I, I understand it. And sometimes too, I think the world sees choice as as a good thing. Like I'm not necessarily talking about the faith, but so many options in life. And and I think maybe for us, it was more like you grew up on a farm, and that's what you did, and you farmed, and it, it keeps the mind. And, and you grew up in your faith. It keeps the mind from wandering too much because a person can um, wonder too much like distractions you know it's it's nice to have things more clearly um, or more kind of one direction so that you you don't have to spend time looking and searching and I know for myself I'm grateful for that just to to be able to chart the course you know and I don't spend time thinking about it too much I just do it well you think about choice sometimes happens in the midst of tragedy because at that point mm -hmm. even people who don't believe in God sometimes get mad at him mm -hmm. for things that happen <laughs> in their life you know which I always find rather ironic yeah, uh, you had that choice when your daughter was born your Sadie was born with a hole in her heart with down syndromes tell me about kind of how faith helped you negotiate that moment sure that was a I look at it now and I think what a special time but at the time when the doctor comes over and, and you're just assuming this baby's going to be like every other baby, which is just regular little sweetheart. Um, the doctor comes over and says, your child has Down syndrome. It was a big shock for Danelle and I. We learned about that about maybe 10 minutes after she was born. And it wasn't a joyful time. It was not something we prayed for. And um, we, it was new, church, new, new territory, and we didn't know what to expect. And, and uh, I remember saying to Danelle moments after that, she's exactly what we need but I didn't feel it. I just knew it to be true because I think my faith knew that, that God would not give us something that wasn't good for us or that we wouldn't cherish. Mm. Um, but I didn't have those feelings. I just methodically thought, you know, thought he must, this must be what we need, you know. But as time went on, and of course now I just look at Sadie, she's four years old and she's just absolutely a doll and she's just like any other of our other children and she gets disciplined the same way and she gets the same attention and she gets the same amount of joys and disappointments or whatever the other kids get it's the same living life with her is the same but when she was born she did have a hole in her heart and um, we were nervous about that I mean the doctors were she was stayed in the hospital a few extra days so they were talking about the blood flow and how that has to get corrected and they were talking about you might have to have a surgery but we're hoping not we'll see how bad it is I said let's ask that her heart will be healed by Tuesday because that's <laughs> when she had her appointment with the with the cardiologist and Danelle said you can't put time limitations on God and I said well why not we're praying for a miracle here <laughs> and so I asked that it was healed by Tuesday and Tuesday we went into the, the 
cardiologist and he looked it over and I just had this good feeling. I just knew it was going to be okay. And he said, mm, looks like everything's fine. She should be fine. I don't think her heart will ever cause her a problem. Looks wow. like it's healed on its own. And would you say that was a miracle? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, it has been such a pleasure to meet with the both of you. I know people need to check out your tour. You're starting in Victoria, going to, how far east are you going? As far as Ottawa. As Ottawa. Yeah. You're leaving behind your maritime roots? <laughs> <laughs> we have to extend the Christmas season, season to two a little months, bit longer. Maybe, yeah. maybe we, we can do that another we year. We do the east coast every second, like we do most of Canada, and then the following year we do America with a week at the end for the east coast of Canada. Oh, so. Wonderful. So people need to check it out on the website on the screen. Yeah. So looking forward to that. You're doing it with your kids. You're going to be performing a few songs with us here a little bit later. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Me. Thank you.